Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Oliver Wieck. I'm the Secretary General of ICC Germany, and I cordially welcome everyone to our workshop on supply chain due diligence, which we're hosting together with our valued partners, Deutsche Post DHL and KPMG. This is the fourth of a series of workshops of the ICC Forum, The Future of International Supply Chains, Sustainable Digital Smart, which we inaugurated in June this year. It was followed by workshops on supply chain finance, digitalization of supply chains, and most recently on supply chains and circular economy. Ladies and gentlemen, more than 500 registrations for today's workshop on uh, supply chain due diligence show how strong the interest in this topic is. One reason certainly is the growing global momentum to extend corporate liability for human rights violations to business and their supply chain activities. Several countries have already passed or are considering legislation that requires companies to conduct human rights due diligence. In our workshop today, you will hear from high-level representatives from the UN and the EU about recent legal developments in supply chain due diligence. You will gain insights into how companies are dealing with the new legislation. You will hear about the experience they have made and learn more about the various initiatives of companies to protect human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, before I hand over to the two moderators, uh, let me introduce today's uh, panelists. First, we have uh, Dante Pesce, who is member of the, and former chair of the UN uh, Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Uh, hello, Dante. He is founder and executive director of the Vincula Center for Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development at the Catholic University of Valparaiso in Chile. Besides that, he's actively collaborated in the development of international standards such as ISO 26000 and the OEC guidelines for multinational corporations. Mr. Pesce is a special advisor on public policy to the United Nations Global Compact, a member of the Stakeholder Council to the Global Reporting Initiative, and a member of the Strategic Advisory Group within ISO 26000. Thank you, Danja, for joining us today. Let me switch now to Gus Hitting. He is Senior Trade Advisor to the European External Action Service, and he chairs the OECD Multi-Stakeholder Steering Group on Responsible Minerals. He focuses on due diligence in supply chains and responsible business conduct from a Brussels and a global perspective, and he also monitors countries' performance on human labor rights and uh, environment under the EU's general scheme of preferences. As ambassador for the EU, uh, EU Council to the UN in Geneva, he contributed to the establishment of the UN Human Rights Council. Thank you, Gus, for taking your time today. Let me now switch to the business representatives uh, on our panel today. First, there is uh, Janina Lucas. Uh, she is head of the Ethics and Social Impact at Bayer AG. She joined Bayer in 2015 and has since worked in sustainability supplier development procurement, sustainability, and communications and sustainability reporting in India and in Germany. She holds a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering and a Bachelor of Arts in Logistics and Technical Business Administration. Great to have you with us today, Jenny. Nicole Chipa is Vice President of Employee Relations at the Deutsche Post DHL Group and responsible for international employee relations, social partners, and employee representation, as well as business and human rights. After joining Deutsche Post uh, DHL Group in 2002, she became Vice President of Compensation and Benefits and Head of Human Resources. Nico Chipa holds a degree in Psychology from the University of Bonn. Thank you for being with us today, Nicole. Today's panel will also be joined by Theo Jekyll. He is Legal Counsel and Business and Human Rights Expert at Ericsson, including um, and responsible for the company's human rights uh, strategy and execution including addressing risks throughout uh, Ericsson's value chain. Theo has previously led uh, the Human Rights Practice Group at uh, Vinge Law Firm, advising corporate clients on human rights, and worked as a researcher at Sweetwatch, conducting research on business impacts on human rights in high-risk contexts. Currently, Theo also holds a position as lecturer in the International Law of Stockholm University, and he is a member of the Board of UN Global Compact Network in Sweden. This workshop will be moderated by Sylvia Trage from KPMG and Crispin Conroy from ICC in Geneva. I'm very pleased that both of you agreed to lead us through our workshop uh, today. 
Sylvia is Director at the Department on Value Chain Transformation at KPMG in Germany. She has more than 20 years of experience in supply chain consulting, uh, starting with Roland Berger and uh, strategy consultants and later with Siemens. In 2000, she started supply chain consulting with a regional focus on Central and Eastern Europe. Her main focus is on optimizing value chain networks and the future competitiveness of supply chains in terms of regulatory, sustainability, decarbonization, circular economy, and ESGs. Crispin is the ICC representative director in Geneva and the ICC permanent observer to the United Nations in Geneva. Prior to his appointment with ICC, Crispin worked with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and had a number of diplomatic postings, including ambassador in Chile and to the Kingdom of Nepal. Before handing over to the two moderators, I want to thank you, dear panelists, uh, for your time and dedication, and certainly our participants for your interest in this workshop and for joining us today. Sylvia, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot. I would like to start with a short keynote speech on recent developments in supply chain due diligence regulations. So when we go to the next slide, the globalization of trade contributed in many ways to the optimization of value networks. It also supported the development in many third world countries significantly. At the same time, this development has led to global supply chain chains being complex, dispersed and non-transparent. Non they often lack visibility and knowledge about the flow of goods. As a result of this, sustainability risks and ethical violations such as pollution and inhuman working conditions are not uncommon along supply chains. For example, 40 million people are victims of modern slavery. 79 million children work under exploitive conditions worldwide. For a long time, companies were not obliged to take responsibility for their upstream supply chain. Most businesses did not pay attention to violations in their own supply chains. Only one in three companies in the EU took action to uphold their due diligence along the supply chain. This is less than 20% of companies comply with due diligence requirements. However, this is about to change now. The ethical and sustainable footprint of supply chains is now becoming the focus of society and politics in industrialized countries. Governments are increasing regulatory pressure on global value networks. This is partly because of the many misalignments. In addition, they represent one of the most important entry points for the implementation of a global unified and substantial response to improve sustainability at global level. When we go to the next slide, please. The result is a tightening of international and national legislation for business. Now they are obliged to act in terms of transparency and responsible business. Companies need to consider the impacts of their activities on society, people, and also the environment along their entire supply chain and conduct due diligence measures. The objective is the mitigation of negative impacts on the environment and strengthening of human rights worldwide. In short, some sustainability and due diligence obligations are no longer just desirable, but mandatory. There are already a lot of regulations worldwide, probably you know most of them, some examples here. We have the corporate social responsibility, it obliged large companies with headquarters within the European Union to report information on environmental protection, social responsibility, combating corruption and bribery, and due diligence procedures throughout the supply chain. Then we have the German Act on Corporate Due Diligence in Supply Chains. It defines how to fulfill obligations which companies have now to fulfill in order to protect human rights how companies can fulfill these obligations in their supply chains and what responsibility companies bear for the conditions of their suppliers. It will become in force in January 2023. Then we have the EU-wide due diligence framework, a legislation on mandatory corporate due diligence covering human rights and environmental risks across a business end-to-end -end supply chain. 
It is expected to be passed in autumn this year. We will come back to this law for sure later in our discussion. Then the regulation of conflict minerals and timber. Conflict materials. Certain valuable metals have led to conflicts in mining areas, especially in Central Africa. As a result, the European Union has declared its member states responsible for serious human rights violations and set a supply chain due diligence requirement for these minerals. Timber, commitment for the proper production of all products brought into the European Union. Illegally harvested and processed timber will be given a deregistration within the European Union. In particular, the recently passed Due Diligence Act increases the pressure on German companies to act. They now have to take responsibility for activities along their whole end-to-end -end supply chains. When we go to the next slide, please. Just a short deep dive uh, regarding the German Due Diligence Act for Global Protection of Human Rights. German companies are specifically requested to ensure that their supply chain is free of human rights and environmental violations. What are the due diligence obligations? By executing a public policy statement on taking responsibility for respecting human rights companies are liable for the activities and conditions of their suppliers. They are obligated to create transparency along the supply chain to ensure that compliance standards are met. In addition, they must conduct regular risk analysis of their suppliers. This aims to identify and advert direct and indirect actual and potential adverse human rights impacts. Nevertheless, companies establish corresponding control mechanism. This includes preventive and also corrective measures to ensure due diligence along the supply chain and establish also a complaints procedure. They are obliged to monitor their foreign suppliers' compliance with minimum social and ecological standards to ensure that child labor and starvation wages are curbed and that environmental destruction is avoided. Crucial is the duty of effort and documentation. For example, the companies must report and potential and actual impacts of their corporate actions and their efforts or mitigation measures. In case of non-compliance with the measures, companies face heavy fines and exclusion from public tenders for up to three years. The law also applies to branches or subsidiaries of foreign companies in Germany if they employ a to total number of more than 3,000 employees from 2023 or 1,000 employees from 2024 in Germany. The scope of business of German companies is expanded. Controlled subsidiaries abroad are counted as part of the company's own business area and are not considered the first supplier. Although this law has turned out to be weaker than originally assumed, it can be expected that the regulatory framework will become much stricter in the future. See the discussions on the EU due diligence. Dante will exa examine this in more detail later on. In view of the threat of sanctions and continuously increasing regulatory and stakeholder requirements, as well as fines, it is clear that compliance with legal framework is crucial for the future competitiveness of com companies. This means strengthening supply chain due diligence is thus becoming increasingly important. Supply chain due diligence describes the efforts made to investigate a potential business partner. It makes a significant contribution to improving the third party risk management and is crucial to the resilience and maintenance of the competitiveness of a supply chain network. The current focus of supply chain due diligence is therefore shifting from finance to sustainability, moving away from the previously dominant factors of just in time and cost efficiency. To the supply chain of the future is fully transparent, responsible, compliant, and sustainable. And now I would like to hand over to Crispin, who will take a closer look at the role of regulation at the political level. Thank you very much, Sylvia, and that was very informative. So for me, I'm sure for the participants. So thank you very much. Uh, just before I start, uh, let me thank our co-hosts for this event, uh, ICC Germany, and Oliver, especially 
you and Dana, and the sponsors, of course, for the ICC and ICC Germany workshop series on the future of international supply chains, sustainable, digital, and smart, of which this is one, one such event. Um, Oliver asked me to give a, a sort of a, an overview perspective of, uh, of ICC's views and what we've been doing recently, and, and then pass on to, uh, to Dante to talk about the global perspective, and then Hus uh, to talk about the EU's perspective, and then I'll hand back to, to Silvia. So, as you'll be, many of you will be well aware, particularly those who work in, in this topic, 10 years ago, something very important took place. Um, states, businesses, and civil society came together to develop an internationally agreed framework on business and human rights, the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or the UNGPs. And they are a framework enshrining states' obligations to protect human rights, corporate responsibilities to respect human rights, and the need for appropriate and effective remedies when those rights are breached. Over the past decade, uh, ICC has actively supported its members to scale up business implementation of the UNGPs. And we also promoted greater implementation of governments by governments by calling for the development of robust national action plans and more work needs to be done here. The UNGPs are a game changer and we should recognize this. They created a space for us in the private sector to deepen our collaboration with the major stakeholders, uh, such as states, trade unions, and civil society organizations. But we must recognize that more needs to be done in the decade ahead, and that all stakeholders, including businesses, must be involved in the new policy and regulatory de development. Let me recognize the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights in this regard, through you, Dante, as former chair, uh, and thank you for joining the panel today. ICC has been actively engaging with the working group, uh, including through our regional consultation with our European network, in which uh, Oliver and ICC Germany played a leading role. And we've also established in recent months in an informal ICC working group on business and human rights to bring together companies from our network to discuss recent policy and legal developments and to share experiences and concerns. If any of the participants here today are interested in learning more about the working group, please do not hesitate to, to contact me. The UNGPs refer clearly to the need for a, a mix of measures, both, both voluntary initiatives and regulatory frameworks to ensure implementation by states and by business. It now seems clear, uh, and Sylvia set this out, that the main focus internationally and in many individual jurisdictions is on developing additional members to further the implementation of uh, measures, excuse me, to further the implementation of the UNGPs through a smart mix of measures, including mandatory measures on human rights due diligence. This is reflected in the steady spread of a patchwork of mandatory measures or a smart mix of mandatory and voluntary measures in a number of jurisdictions. But this patchwork has the potential to create increasing uncertainty for business and risks creating an un even playing field for operations. A number of our, our leading businesses are actively supporting some sort of mandatory human rights due diligence measures with the objective that such measures would promote greater consistency in a level playing field. However, others, especially SMEs, have concerns such as the burden of additional regulatory requirements and the extent of liability. Greater business engagement in shaping future legislative measures, in sharing global break practice, and in providing support for SMEs is required. In order to accelerate the implementation of the UNGPs, an internationally consistent next generation smart mix of implementation measures must deliver multi-stakeholder policy coherence and a level play playing field for all companies, large or small. Looking to the second decade of the UNGPs, we must place an absolute focus on policy interventions that can make an immediate difference in the real world especially for those most vulnerable to human rights violations. This will require a variety of initiatives at different levels, underpinned by a, a range of policy measures. Uh, events like this, and thank you again, Oliver and other partners, clearly allow, allow for business voices to be heard and for us to share our perspectives with policymakers like uh, Dante and, and Hus. So let me now pass over to you, Dante, to talk um, about the, the, the global legal developments and policy framework developments. And then I'd ask you to, to hand over to Hus 
before Sylvia manages the, the, the business discussion. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much for the invitation and greetings from Santiago, Chile. Um, I would like to reflect uh, in the context of the 10th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights uh, that came, that happened in, in June this year. And, and what are the findings of the stop taking exercise that we carry on over a period of one and a half years, actually with the support of ICC globally and Chris, uh, Crispin's team, but, but also from Germany and consultations that we organize around the world. Uh, one, one thing, uh, a few measures or indicators of somehow success of the process. We were expecting something like 20 or 30 written contributions. We got 220. We were expecting up to 30 consultations. We had 70, including China and Japan. Um, we were expecting two or three events around the 10th anniversary of the Guiding Principles. There were 17, uh, one organized by ICC, in fact. Um, so all this shows that there is increasing appetite to discuss the guiding principles, the practical implementation, the lessons learned, uh, how far have we gone and how far we have not gone. Uh, and let me uh, um, signal some of the findings of this uh, exercise and then connect to the conversation that we're having today. Uh, the due diligence is becoming normalized in Western Europe, not really anywhere else. Uh, we don't have a level playing field, and the Global South have been, for the most part, not completely absent of the conversation of mandatory human rights due diligence. There are some initiatives and some few places, but overall, this is uh, so far a North-South conversation that is not taking place on the same level, with the same level of maturity, institutions, etc., which is in itself a gap something that is not impossible to overcome, but of course, it represents a risk of this connection uh, between North and South. But due diligence is clearly becoming normal is in Western Europe, and, and our expectation is by the end of this decade should be fully normalized as not even good norm, uh, uh, business practice, but as common uh, business practice, as part of normal. Um, the second thing that we saw is the investors wave and the investors are capturing uh, uh, human rights and uh, human rights risks more and more in their, into their policies and their investment portfolio. And, and we see here a great opportunity, um, but with some risks too, uh, the risk of disinvesting or de-risking by companies instead of using their leverage to, com to confront or try to solve societal challenges where they operate, they might decide to shortcut and, and basically uh, increase their profile regarding risks by not doing business in countries in my own region, Latin America, for example. And that is linked to the third element, which is capacity and asymmetry of competencies, vision, ownership and capacity. So I will say, what happens at the other side of your chains? Uh, what is the level of ownership where you do business? at the local level, not at your subsidiary or your own management team that probably are already into this agenda, but what happens with your business partners and their associations? Uh, what's the level of ownership, capacity, vision? They see this trend as something positive that will enhance their competitiveness, uh, increase their profile, profile to access uh, capital or to access markets, or they will perceive it as um, a new commercial barrier or, uh, let's say, um, uh, picky Europeans asking too much and squeeze, in order to squeeze me further. Uh, as they know more about me, uh, productivity gains, that's what SMEs tend to say, productivity gains tend not to be captured by the SME itself, uh, but it, it tends to be captured by the larger company that has more power. So there's a, a power asymmetry here. Um, that also is a finding of, of our report. Um, then there is an element that is cross-cutting, which is policy coherence. And, and we see a patchwork of policies. Uh, Crispin just said that, I, I agree with his statement, that there are policies being put in place with inconsistency. Uh, Europe has a great opportunity, the European Union, to have consistency, a level playing field on regulation with the future directive, um, but that is uh, Europe. And the European Union represents 6% of the global population. 
uh, Europe overall is 10% of the global population. And there is a, a question mark here, what happens with everyone else in this conversation that is going to be impacted by your decisions, but are not part of the discussion on equal footing. And uh, so what we are suggesting are uh, accompany uh, policies to build that infrastructure, to strengthen that capacity, to bring in pretty much everyone possible on, on, on the same, let's say, page in order not to have this asymmetry. Uh, but again, I signal to you, uh, what is your relation with your contractors, suppliers, business partners at the other end? And, and what is the, let's say, the work being done in terms of strengthening their capacity, their competencies, and leveling the, the, the playing field in terms of power relations? Um, you in Germany has the, um, the, uh, the, the, let's say, your uh, uh, economic policies uh, have always stressed the, the good re and healthy relation between business and your unions. Uh, it is basically uh, putting on the same level of a conversation those ones impacted by your decisions, your own workers. Uh, and I will say, by analogy, is that happening around the world? And I will say, for the most part, no. Uh, can it happen? Yes, of course. And we need it to happen uh, in order not to have backlash or pushbacks uh, at the other end of the chain. So I just signal, let's say, concerns that pop up in our consultations. Uh, we have uh, limitations of data evidence, monitoring, learning, knowledge management. So and, and there is a, a very important role for industry associations to be and build platforms for learning, uh, to experiment, to innovate, and to be able to do that in a consistent matter, manner uh, in order to share and get everyone to speed. In the pre-competitive space, there's enormous room for improvement. And I will say everywhere in the world, including Europe, uh, but certainly in the rest of the world, uh, where we have la lack of capacity or insufficient capacity, except some, let's say, 10, 15, maybe 20 countries that are making some progress in the global south, the other 150 are not really. Uh, and therefore, we have there uh, a gap. Uh, in terms of business models, we also identify conversations that are missing. Uh, let's say it was mentioned already, fast fashion, uh, which is an example. Um, the analysis of business models and what are their impacts in the reality on the ground and on the ground everywhere, not only at headquarters, uh, in which case it will be protecting somehow the brand um, in, a, in a centralized manner, but actually whatever a company operates, what, what, what are the practical consequences of the business model or models? And those uncomfortable conversations, we know that they are not easy conversations, to challenge the models themselves are is something that for the most part is not taking place yet can it take place of course should it take place absolutely it should take place and there are some other uh, uh uncomfortable conversations to have on corruption on corporate capture of the state on political contributions from companies um so and we and i can go on and on on legacy colonialism uh so there are conversations to have and I will say the natural place to have those conversations as a safe space are the industry associations, uh, to be the space for the uncomfortable conversations to discuss the uh, business models. And then finally, remedy remains a patchwork. Uh, access to remedy, we have different approaches, we have different policies. Overall, the practical experience of people that have been subject to human rights abuses or negative impacts uh, remains not only patchy but difficult uh, with with uh, uh, huge gaps when you look after accessing remedy around the world so looking into the future and I have already signaled a number of entry points for industry associations and for companies uh, the next decade will be a decade of an, um, an ambition that needs to be raised and we will we're trying to raise the ambition the smart mix will continue to evolve and I agree with what has seen been said before in terms of how it's going to look like so we will have more policy and regulations, yes, that we need a lot of companying measures that, that don't have to be mandatory, uh, but those companying measures can be in the smart mix, uh, mix um, on board and on the table from day one. Um, we, we have to focus on implementation and its in effectiveness. And for there, we need to learn from the practitioners, from you, what works, what doesn't, how can we get things done? Uh, what are the lessons learned from practical implementation? So all around peer learning, knowledge management is indispensable 
because we need better policies. We need to advance measures, but better informed and informed by the practitioners. I don't know better. We, my team, don't know better than you on what works and what doesn't. Uh, and therefore, we need you on board, on, on the same level, on the same room, to discuss what is working and also to avoid unintended negative consequences. Uh, how to avoid the, the risking risk, uh, how to avoid that. Um, because it's a, it's a real risk that we are confronting and we are getting anecdotal information more and more that we're heading in that, in that direction. And then I will say on the ground, I already mentioned the idea of what, what is the capacity, the awareness, the ownership of the other side of the chain, but also what is the power that people have at the other side of the chain uh, to address the power imbalance in order to have solutions that actually work uh, equally uh, for both ends and not only for one end. And, and that is a question mark that I just put on the table for you that I don't have an answer. Uh, I can imagine answers, uh, but certainly it's something that I will say uh, is, is up to you to uh, educate us and to share what works, what doesn't, um, etc. Finally, what has worked well in the past is likely to repeat, and what has worked badly in the past is likely to repeat. Therefore, what I'm trying to say is that we need to build on previous experiences in order to push this agenda into practice based on institutions, infrastructure, capacity, and experience that is already there, that probably has not been developed for this purpose, or maybe yes, but that can be expanded. Ex ex example, health and safety into the supply chain. I'm sure you have a lot of work there that can be expanded in the relationship with suppliers. Or uh, integrity and, and, the, and the fight against corruption. I'm sure that at the governance level of your companies, you have experience on good governance regarding integrity. I will say those are low-hanging fruits in terms of experiences to build on in order to address the, the many challenges that we face in terms of practical implementation looking into the future. And I think that was those were all my remarks. And again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Dante. Um, Who's can I pass over to you, please? And uh, you need to unmute. I need to do it myself. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Chris, and thank you, uh, Sylvia, for uh, the introduction and for and for Oliver and his team for kindly hosting this meeting. Well, let me start uh, not by quoting uh, Forrest Gump, but rather John John Ruggy, he, who sometimes he was reputed to say from time to time, and uh, he passed away first of all on the 16th of uh, of September. He said, shift happens. Indeed, we're seeing this shift happening. Now, also, I think with the von der Leyen Commission, if you see it, look at the late, the legislative agenda to which I would refer later, it is vast. Compare that to the situation to which also Sylvia referred, uh, uh, I would say in uh, 2016, 2017, were the only two elements, or perhaps at the corporate the, the corporate uh, reporting, but with the only elements we had was the minerals regulation and the timber regulation. Well, with the timber with the minerals regulation, uh, for those that want to look it up, 2017/821, uh, we 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 have some, and I stress some experience as lawmakers, but also as implementors at member state and at EU level with doing due diligence. Yeah, it is still, to a certain extent, even the minerals regulation is a pilot laboratory, it might go too far, for mandatory human rights due diligence. And just think of what is coming when we're looking at a wider due diligence obligation with includes which includes environment and sustainability. Yeah, where we are still indeed testing, testing the ground and not entirely certain on the impacts are when it comes to the impact on the ground, notably in the upstream of the supply chain. 
what are the real impact on on small and medium-sized companies micro smes economic operators local communities in very many of the eu's sourcing countries there are some companies and i think apple for instance is an example and i assume a number of those on the call are doing it they are reporting on the impact of their sourcing decisions but again uh, that report on the impact of measures company decisions on sourcing decisions on, on on impact on the ground hasn't always translated in the same approach at government level we're seeing also also because of the minerals regulation a very serious discussion where we haven't gotten to operational solutions yet how are the costs and values they're two sides of the same coin in a way of doing due diligence distributed across the supply chain if you have zero 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 micrograms of tin for instance in a smartphone uh, the impact for the upstream uh, is much wider if you're a miner and have to pay for a a certification system or or, or some kind of uh, of i think blockchain based mechanism and 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 by the newest gen latest generation of a mobile phone, a rugged mobile phone that will not break when you drop it. Uh, indeed, you're looking at a completely different cost picture. Also, what we've learned so far is that due diligence laws, companies doing due diligence, whether they do it voluntary or based on mandatory due diligence, or companies, collaborative company schemes, are simply not enough at the end of the day. How does one ensure also, especially upstream, government level good governance? So again, that's, uh, I'm not inventing anything. It's, it's the first pillar basically of what John Ruggie already wrote. And again, how, how do we deal with that? When it comes to the supply chain schemes, uh, we're all still within the EU. I know the commission is still considering how we will address that. What kind of place supply chain schemes will have in our future regulation in the minerals regulation yeah, but it's a rather i would say limited sectoral experience in the battery regulation it's included what will be included in the deforestation initiative the Su sustainable product initiative uh, or the wider uh, reinders breton sustainable corporate governance initiative is still to be seen one issue which uh, Dante, of course, is, is much more, uh, has met much more involved in also uh, because of its work with the working group is the negotiations on the legally binding instrument. Difficult negotiations in Geneva on a, an entirely personal basis, I can see, I see slowly seeing some kind of more engagement by those that are currently outside the room because everybody realized realizes we need to we need some kind of instrument but we also need a much more level playing field also to address again coming back to the first pillar the governmental aspect in some of the large upstream uh, sourcing uh, countries and now when it comes to well the sustainable corporate governance initiative sylvia is right in saying we're aiming or the commission is aiming yeah, uh, for 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 the autumn depends if it's a meteorological autumn or the astronomical autumn uh, but, uh, so we may even see the month of december playing a role and there are two elements the mandatory due diligence human rights but also environment sustainability and the corporate governance aspect you see a lot of information on the on the net and I even printed yesterday i can't do any publicity but there was a law firm that even published uh, already in the month of june what would be the contours what would be the challenges for companies under the new uh, uh, legislation i think it's no longer a secret and uh, dg reiner said said so has said so that the legislation will go further in terms of company coverage and tiers in the supply chain coverage go further than the German and the French legislation. It will be cross-sectoral, all companies, independent of size, but uh, with an element, of course, of proportionality uh, as to the extent of due diligence, depending on the size, but also depending 
on the risk. And of course, there is a liability for harm with all the complications one can imagine. And the German discussion, I think, so far has been the only real discussion as to the, the depth of that issue. But again, uh, that is also still likely to be part of the proposal. You've certainly heard uh, last month the speech by the President of the Commission, von der Leyen, uh, the State of the Union speech, on uh, her intention uh, to ban products uh, produced with forced labor entering the EU market. I cannot say anything else that currently the Commission is reflecting on options and initiatives. That's what we are. Uh, we, we, we all remember, especially some of the companies on this call, the rather bold action, uh, my words, uh, not, not the EU words, bold action by the UN, by some of the experts, by the working group, on the letter addressed to a number of governments and companies on, on forced labor uh, last year. Eh? That was uh, uh, something uh, uh, which I think Dante was also slightly involved in. Uh, now, finally, I, of course, uh, like I said earlier, it all depends on the final format of the Corporate Social Reporting uh, re uh, Act, how the batteries regulation will look at, like, what the deforestation, which products are we covering in the deforestation initiative will look like, the Sustainable Product Initiative, Sustainability Taxonomy, so a whole range of legislative initiative, also largely linked to the Green Deal, so I think the Commission and, and all its services, which as a relative outsider from the Foreign Service, I can say that they're all conscious and convinced that there will be issues that require addressing. Again, these are my words, there is no official Commission line on the issues, it depends on the content of the proposals, but no doubt countries, people know that countries, and in particular economic operators, so EU member states, but also third countries, and economic operators need time to adapt. And I will just recall the fact that the minerals regulation was adopted, I think, in May 2017. The hard obligation to do due diligence for EU importers of the three Ts and gold only came into application on the 1st of January 2021. So we have only now a bit more than nine months of experience. It is also clear to everybody that we need accompanying measures at some point. A very vague term, as you've seen on the minerals regulation that we're doing it, yeah, uh, for the upstream, including the vulnerable communities, because that is where a large part of the impact of our measures will be felt. We will, of course, need measures for small and medium-sized enterprises, micro SMEs, both upstream and within the EU. Yeah, going even further, I would say, again, a personal opinion, further than due diligence-ready websites helping the people along, but it is a, 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 a complicated process. So all these are needed in view of the wide range of our measures. And finally, uh, probably the only real foreign relations uh, uh, Ministry of Economic uh, Foreign uh, Affairs remark, all this has an impact on our relations with developing and developed countries. So that's also an issue that needs to be and will be managed uh, by, by the Commission. And again, as, as, as we speak today, uh, we are still working together with DG Trade. Just to give you an example of also the hard work ongoing inside the House is on the approval of the alignment of a number of industry schemes with the due diligence uh, uh, requirements under the minerals regulation. So company schemes can apply for alignment approval. That is ongoing, of course, if you're looking at audits and shadow audits with all difficulties you can imagine in these COVID days. So again, that is at a, uh, a, a micro level on the minerals regulation uh, ongoing, which also demonstrates the fact that 
uh, this will require, and that's also a message, I, I, I trust that some of my messages will somehow make it also via the German industry to Commissioner von der Leyen, no doubt, uh, uh, are important considerations in terms of manpower requirements within the Commission. I've made it a bit too political. I realize that, and I excuse. Uh, uh, I, I present my excuses to the to the organisers for this. No need to to give any excuses. Of course, it's always great to have your views and and your frank views. So thanks both to Anta and to Hus. Now, Sylvia, um, you're going to lead the the next panel discussion. However, we do have a question, and I know Dante has to leave in in half an hour. So. Sylvia, would you like me to read out the question for Dante and Hus? Yeah, okay, then we should first answer the question and then I will open the uh, discussion on the um, company side, yeah. Great, let's just see if I'm able to do that after offering to do so. <laughs> I think I can. Yeah, so um, Dante and Hus and also any other panelists, if you have a view. There's a question uh, which is, to what extent should the historic trade marginalization of continents like Africa from global supply chain and value chains for finished goods feature as an ESG and human rights issue for companies and investors. Uh, in Africa, many respects, <clears throat> in many respects, has been affected by its leg le legacy of colonization and has been subject to the export of raw materials alone. Of course, I know that with your experience in the minerals, you may have some comments on this, and, and perhaps you as well, Dante, giving your earlier comments about the need for action in in other continents, not just in, in, in Europe. Thanks. Who would like to have a go? Well, I, I'm not sure whether one, uh, whether you will uh, hear much from me, whether the finished goods uh, objective or or, or, or or target should be part of the, of the ESG. Uh, what I can only testify that uh, based again on the minerals experience, we're seeing uh, attempts to uh, uh, to bring parts of the supply chain, notably then smelters and refiners, uh, to Africa. So to make that at least to have that important part of the supply chain also closer to the sourcing uh, uh, operations. So that's the only thing we're seeing so far, I must say. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I. Um... I, I mentioned in my intervention on the difficult conversations to have the the conversation about legacy and colonialism. And uh, that is very visible, tangible in Africa. Uh, legacy is perhaps less tangible in Latin America, where I live, uh, because our independence took place uh, way before. But, but uh, let's say the reminiscence of class and race uh, remains very, very tangible on the daily life of human rights defenders, for example, and the power imbalance without being challenged is part of our normal. Uh, so it's kind of accepted by our elite that is normal to have power imbalance. Um, and it's not even something to be discussed because that is how the world is. Uh, and that is, of course, legacy. Um, so we, we do have a, a, a difficult or uncomfortable conversation to have with the local elites. And that is something that certainly can be pushed by the EU, can be pushed by large European companies through your subsidiaries and your business relationships to challenge those elements that are linked to legacy uh, that are of many aspects awful nature. Um, and, and I will say that goes hand in hand with the power imbalance and the need to strengthen capacity at local level and to gain ownership by by the local business community but also that business community to, to understand that that they need to be legitimate in the eyes of the other locals uh, their own stakeholders uh, in this context of power imbalance um, so i will say there's a lot of room there for improvement certainly a lot of room for improvement uh, where large brands can do a lot if you act together, collectively. And there are some experiences of collective action. Let's say the Bangladesh Accord and, and what's going on there, the, the uh, Thailand uh, fishery turnaround in, in experience, 
and, and in some other, uh, let's say, sectors where when there is collective action, th there is a realistic opportunity for change. Um, and that requires leadership from the top uh, and from the ones that are more enlightened, understanding that there are a number of issues that are not in the public domain. No one will talk about racism or no one will talk about classism uh, in the context of, let's say, my part of the world or Africa or Southeast Asia, let's say, it will be very, very, let's say, unpolite, uncomfortable, almost an impossible conversation. But that can be brought, brought in by a third party, hopefully in a coalition, um, in order not to expose one particular brand uh, to some sort of retaliation or bad feelings, etc. But a lot of room in this question for improvement. Thank you. Perhaps, perhaps if I may add, from our experience, which is all, one of my other hats, is we, we, we're of course monitoring on the general system of preferences, uh, which are the, the, the somewhat generous trade preferences we give to countries where, as, as different uh, as from Pakistan to, to Sri Lanka and, and even to Cambodia, uh, where you over the years, uh, the, the current scheme is now in operation, I think, for a good uh, eight years. Uh, and, and the Commission just adopted a proposal for a new scheme, legally to be applied as from the 1st of January 24. What we saw there is very slow and very incremental, this movement uh, up, up the value chain. You see it within textiles to certain uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, sub uh, uh, certain products within the textile sector, you see it moving to different sectors such as medical equipment or in the case of even, even of Cambodia uh, um, under the partial withdrawal, but we didn't touch that sector, uh, the bicycle industry. So we were also, also very careful not to touch even with the withdrawal, partial withdrawal of preferences, Cambodia, to touch those sectors, at least we try to avoid those, where they had moved up the value chain uh, again. But it's a very slow, slow uh, movement. In, in a way, uh, our tariff preferences are, are double-edged swords. The fact that we give preferences makes make sure that you can, can still continue to produce uh, basic material at zero import duties. But again, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure whether any ESG reporting and requirement in itself will actually make that change happen. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, I suggest we will now take a closer look at the business perspective of regulation. Some very experienced business representatives will give us now some insights on how they meet the increasing demands for responsible supply chain management, what have they already done, and what are challenges they are facing. First of all, Deutsche Post DHL Group. I know um, DP DHL is already strongly committed to human rights and introduced them as a core value of the company. Nicole, can you elaborate on the measure DP DHL implemented to comply with international human rights standards national laws or other regulatory. Thank you, Silvia. So first of all, since maybe not everybody knows what we have under our wings as the group Deutsche Post DHL, I would like to quickly give you an overview of our businesses. So we operate in five different business units in 220 countries and territories around the world. And um, we have about 570,000 employees altogether. Some of you might know the German post, which delivers the classical letters and parcels, um, but we also operate International Express um, courier um, topics. Then we have um, International Air Freight and Ocean Freight, as well as road transportation. Um, we have the classical warehouse management in international supply chains. And recently, we also included e-commerce solutions. And as you can see from all these business units, we are not a producer of goods, but we are transporting goods all around the world. And therefore, um, green um, logistics as well as decarbonization have 
been on our agenda for a long time already and we have set ourselves very ambitious targets to be at zero emission in 2050 and I think we were one of the earliest companies on that. But today we are talking more about human rights than about the green side and Silvia as you mentioned um, we have embedded sustainability in our strategy and agenda 2025 on several pillars along the E, the S and the G pillar and um, on the social side um, human rights policy statement has been published um, last year which is an add-on to our already existing code of conduct as well as supplier code of conduct where we specify um, the areas we are focusing on within our specific business in terms of um, respecting human rights and um, also considering the green aspects um, of due diligence and, and sus sustainability topics. Um, besides these policies, um, we have already implemented a couple of measures in the past years. So, for example, since 2013, we have established a routine um, to review countries regarding their employee relations as well as human rights compliance. And we pick um, between two and five countries per year to go there with a mixed team of internal colleagues following SMETA standards. We are auditing those countries um, internally, um, issue a report which is corresponding with the SMETA standard. And we do this not as a kind of internal police organization, but we see this as a learning opportunity for all our colleagues in the countries to show them where they are potentially um, deviating from local guidelines as well as from, from um, the um, general human rights approach we have. And if there are any irregularities, we also help them to set up remedies to correct those um, findings. And uh, we visit them regularly afterwards to see how they improved and keep a constant dialogue with them. Um, Besides that, we have also established a couple of training um, formats in our company. Um, we have a training called Building Great Employee Relations, which has been running for years and also covers human rights topics. And we are currently establishing a mandatory e-learning for all our top managers um, to give them very clear guidance what human rights means. These are just a couple of examples, but along the required due diligence cycle, we've also established a couple of measures um, to assess all our countries regarding their, their current status of human rights. And we are working on improving the standards besides the country reviews we are doing uh, in the future to give them some, some counseling and some support to become better by themselves because we as a central team and also our divisional um, colleagues, human rights experts cannot be in all the countries at the same time. And therefore we want to enable our colleagues in the countries in HR and health and safety and also local management to know by themselves what is required and what they can do driving forward their business in accordance with the human rights and the other due diligence requirements. So I think in terms of our own um, employees, we are quite advanced already and we are also progressing in terms of supplier due diligence. But as you can imagine, since we already have 570,000 own employees and thousands of legal entities around the world, counting the number of our suppliers is probably um, high in the five digit arena. And so we will not be able to engage on individualized conversations with each of our suppliers. But what we need there going forward is a standardization that will enable us to operationalize the requirements of due diligence uh, and have easy conversations with all our suppliers, being it very small companies or also larger uh, companies, um, to be able to engage very quickly and also have results very quickly since we are a company that needs to get set clear targets um, that can be operationalized as part of our culture we get things done when we know what we need to tell our partners and we are more than ready to engage on a learning journey 
but what we need here is some more clarity probably on industry level as well because our requirements will be different from other producers or from consumer or electronics companies. Thanks a lot, um, Nicole. Just one more question. You talked, uh, you provided some insight regarding um, your own company. What mm -hmm. is uh, with regard to possible suppliers? What um, have you already been doing um, regarding human rights and in including your supply chain? Mm -hmm. So, as I mentioned, we have updated our supplier code of conduct, including human rights due diligence awards, and we expect all our suppliers to sign this code of conduct for suppliers and also um, declare their readiness to comply with these standards. And when we are engaging in tenders, we are asking them some very detailed questions about their business practices which is part of our own approach before we sign a contract. Very similar as our own customers are asking us very detailed questions because we are their supplier in, in many cases. And we are also ready um, to be transparent and answer all the questions we are getting there. Um, so I think in terms of establishing contracts and establishing a clear understanding what we need in terms of a good collaboration, um, we have already made some steps, but one of the next steps will be to establish a kind of um, auditing system or a due diligence as well as consequence management. Because, as I said, we have so many different suppliers, so we are still in the learning um, phase to see what exactly we can do whenever we identify or get knowledge of, of anything that needs to be changed. We don't just want to run away and exit the business or the partnership because that will neither help us nor their employees or their supply chain. But ideally, we try first to improve the situation and get up to the standards. Um, but if it's, if it's not possible, then we have more steps um, also to, to take consequences ourselves. But as I said, we cannot do that on an individual base. Um, we need to establish specific standards that would apply for a certain type of suppliers in a consistent manner. Um, what I found very interesting, what you mentioned, were the um, company-specific reviews. Um, does this also include um, personal visits of suppliers, for example? It depends on, on um, the base of, of those visits. Mm -hmm. We would do that in, in specific cases if we have substantial knowledge that um, something isn't as according to our standards. Okay, thanks a lot, Nicole. Um, then I would like to move over to, to Bayer. Um, Bayer was a founding member of the United Nations Global Compact Initiative and has committed itself to 10 principles derived from the United Nations universal declaration of human rights. Um, Janina, um, how have you embedded the issue of human rights at Bayer and what commitments does Bayer make to respect, for example, human rights? Um, so also, and many thanks for the questions, also very briefly for the audience, in case you don't know the entire portfolio Bayer is having, um, just very crisp. Um, we are an international um, company on almost all um, countries uh, out in the world. We, we, we have our footprint there, either through our supply chain or through our own um, operations. And we mainly have two like uh, big businesses uh, with us. One is healthcare. We are talking about pharmaceuticals, but also consumer health products. And one is the whole crop science industry, where we're looking on um, pesticides, but also seeds. Um, yeah, right. So we've been one of the founders of the UN um, Global Compact and also a huge supporter and an advocate for the UN Guiding Principles. Um, we are supporting um, these principles and also the Declaration of Human Rights and the ILO commitments, the core um, um, labor conventions. Um, 
the commitment found its way in our human rights policy, uh, which we founded and introduced um, some years ago. And this policy is kind of the baseline for um, our entire value chain, for our own operations, um, first and foremost, but also for our supply chain and our downstream product sites. For our product sites and supplier sites, we have also uh, different um, concepts additionally in place. And um, if you like, I can also share a little bit more insights about what we're doing with our supply chain. But um, as a first step, uh, which I sincerely believe companies should start with, are actually their own operations. Companies need to understand, and this is what we did also in the beginning, what are our highest um, human rights risk we are having? What is really our uh, most severe areas we need to uh, focus on? Um, we are applying there the concept of the UN guiding principles um, by doing our saliency risk assessment and feel comfortable in following the outcome of this, where we really get guidance, where to focus on for our own operations, but also for our um, other parts of the value chain. This is also one concern um, we are having when we are looking on the um, legal regulations that um, the methodologies companies applying when they are linked very closely to the UNGPs, if they might be not um, acknowledged from externally or if legal regulations are a little bit deviating from the guiding principles and thus create quite some challenges internally and in how to translate the guiding principles, which we believe is a great um, voluntary um, framework. Thus, we support actually um, legislative uh, measures. Um, so what we, we have besides the policies are trainings. Um, we have our internal audit function, auditing our um, own facilities around the world um, based on sample um, audits to check if our policy statements are really adhered to. And if not, um, corrective actions um, are following. And these are tracked in um, um, systems in our audit um, 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 compliance management system where we see where might countries deviate from our global standards and where are they on the journey to close any um, um, gaps. So to say we have in general global standards at, at, at Bayer that's looking on our um, global program to pay each and every employee a living wage um, no matter if there is a local minimum wage or no local minimum wage ratified by a country. So we have that global standards and this is what we audit um, against. Um, and when we are looking on supply chain, um, we have actually a similar program established for our supply chain management activities. So what did we do there also um, a decade ago, we established, we call it a four-step management approach, which is starting, first of all, setting our expectations. They are part of our supplier code of conduct. So kind of our human rights policy translated for our suppliers in the supplier code of conduct. Um, and then we have an um, risk um, categorization to all our 90,000 plus um, suppliers to identify which of those suppliers might potentially have a huge risk. And these all um, suppliers are then every year um, coming on the list. And then we're checking them either by online assessments or on-site audits to check if they adhere to our um, code of conduct. And if not, then we are coming also to corrective action plans, consequence measures, etc. And only as a last exit, in case we see that a supplier does not um, want to improve over a course of time, over an agreed period of time, that um, he or she should close any gaps, only then we observe the right to terminate the business relationship. But we really believe in meeting the supplier where they are, meeting where they are in their social, cultural environment and not forcing um, our values to the supplier and by that risking unintended consequences, but really understand what is the situation on the ground, what is the capacity um, the suppliers are having in order then to team up with them in order to improve the um, um, performance of the supplier. Um, and last but not least, and there I like to pick up actually Dante and Goose, what you've been saying and what we also did, where I also really hope, and that's actually an ask also for the policymakers to take that into consideration, um, regarding um, when we are establishing what we do, um, um, measures for our 
indirect suppliers, so our tier two, three, and four suppliers. We do that for those um, suppliers where we have a high risk, and these you can find in our agricultural supply chain. Um, and what we are doing there, we team up with um, the countries, and they mainly are located in the global south, to better understand what do they want, what could um, cause any unintended consequences and what kind of programs we can jointly together with the local communities, civil society organizations and companies, also our peers, to develop in order to, um, to have programs that really are um, creating the impact we are desiring. Um, and, but what I'm seeing or where I have some um, um, concerns is that these activities might be not that incentivized from legal regulations, that um, companies uh, might be overwhelmed with too many legal uncertainties. Um, we hear a lot of this cut and run approaches rather than stay and behave. And I really am a big fan of stay and behave because this is where change and the shift is happening but i see that in case legal regulations do not really take this into consideration that there might be country, uh, companies leaving countries not because they want but because they simply have no idea how to really fulfill that requirements thanks a lot uh, janina just one question from my side what do you think about um, industry-specific standards, for example, and what is the current status here? Um, I think industry-specific standards can help when they are developed in a multi-stakeholder dialogue, when all sides are heard, not just the industry, but also um, civil society organizations um, and also all members of that uh, value uh, chain network, and Sylvia, I think you, you called that, when they are um, mutually deciding what is can be considered as best practice. And um, then I believe they can really um, move, yeah, bring the whole entire industry forward. That means these standards also need to be acknowledged externally, that this is really a high standard and not just kind of a greenwashing standard, but the standard that is ambitious and that has some kind of checks included that it's not only um, yeah, considered as too easy to achieve, but really as kind of the gold standard for an industry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks a lot. So now we come to our third um, uh, contribution from the business perspective. One industry that is particularly affected by violations of human rights, due diligence, obligations, is for sure information and communication technologies, especially the production of hardware. There are several global cross-sectoral challenges with regard to human rights. So Ericsson has done an excellent job, I think, in identifying human rights that are most at risk from the company's activities and business relationships. Theo, can you elaborate on your approach to the list of key human rights issues in the supply chain and name some of the most important risks and what you have done so far? Yes, uh, so thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to uh, tell you a little bit more about uh, our approach to, to managing human rights risks in our supply chain. Uh, and the recent work that we've done on um, categorizing our salient and most prior prioritized human rights risks. Um, so, of course, I mean, just to, again to give you a brief uh, background about uh, Ericsson, I mean, we are a telecommunications uh, vendor and network provider, so we provide the uh, uh, infrastructure mostly then to mobile operators. So, we build the infrastructure, which of course requires uh, a lot of hardware, uh, but our supply chain, I mean, we, are, we operate in basically every country in the world, and we have uh, over 20,000 direct suppliers, and this is a quite a diverse supply chain. It's everything from hardware manufacturing to service providers, such as those that install the, uh, the, uh, the network hardware. Uh, so it's also, of course, a wide range of, of human rights issues that uh, are relevant in our, uh, in our supply chain. Uh, while we do have a, a long-running uh, responsible sourcing program, 
that is similar to what has been described uh, here already today. So I won't go into detail to that with audits and follow up and monitoring and so on. Uh, what we have recently started to do is that um, we've seen that in our industry, or at least from our perspective, the main challenges are not in our first tier suppliers. Uh, it's more upstream where we see the real challenges from a human rights perspective. And that's why it's important to consider our approach or, or generally from a company perspective uh, when addressing human rights, that it's a full value chain perspective. So for example, a legislation that would limit our responsibility to our first tier suppliers wouldn't really make sense from our perspective because that wouldn't then put our resources where they really uh, uh, matter. So we need this full value chain approach to also have a level playing field. Uh, I think that's an, 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 a clear uh, uh, learning from us as well is that when we talk to our suppliers and when we raise requirements that are related to issues such as trade compliance, anti-bribery laws, privacy laws, for example, uh, these are hard requirements that there is really no discussion with our suppliers that they need to comply with. But because of the lack of a level playing field when it comes to human rights, it becomes much more difficult to uh, implement uh, our commitments uh, further upstream in the supply chain. If we manage to have a live level playing field and a common understanding of what these commitments are, we can then in a more collaborative approach with uh, first, second and third tier suppliers, hopefully uh, find common approaches to these, uh, to these challenges. Um, so what we recently did was that we uh, did a, a project that was running during the entire uh, uh, last year uh, where we started to in much more detail map our supply chain, uh, looking at issues such as uh, countries of operations, uh, the uh, uh, composition of the workforce. So, for example, uh, I mean, is it uh, a large percentage of migrant workers or other vulnerable groups? Uh, previous audit results, uh, which industry we were talking about, uh, and then mapping these uh, results to different human rights uh, issues. Uh, and based on that, and also, of course, external stakeholder engagements with stakeholders on the ground in these countries and other expert organizations, started to map out uh, some issues that we saw more uh, uh, prioritized and more severe. Uh, in, in our supply chain. So of course, our commitment is to all human rights and, and we will continue to address those issues throughout our responsible sourcing program. But what we are now doing with a set of seven prioritized salient human rights issues in our supply chain uh, is to have a more proactive and collaborative approach, uh, kind of going beyond audits uh, in, in these cases, uh, where we see that we need to have a, a close collaboration with our first tier suppliers to be able to reach further upstream. We have previously tried to uh, engage uh, second and third tier suppliers directly, but we've learned that without the kind of buy-in from our direct suppliers and without their support and commitment, this engagement becomes very difficult and, and cumbersome because we don't have that same direct relationship with the second and third or fourth tier suppliers. So we really need the, the, the commitment and, and the collaboration from our first year suppliers. And we've also brought on board our customers to these conversations. So just by having our customers, Ericsson, our suppliers, and maybe a second tier supplier that our supplier has, has uh, contacted, we already have four tiers of a supply chain that can work together to, to, to address some of these uh, salient human rights issues. And what we're trying then is, is pilot projects now. This is, of course, at a, at a very early stage. So in a few countries where we have identified issues, uh, such as, for example, we have uh, started a pilot project in Malaysia on forced labor in the ICT industry. That is a, a very prevalent issue in, in Malaysia and, and a big supplier base for us, where we have together with our first tier suppliers and then second, third tier suppliers, and now even talking to, to labor brokers, uh, to start discussing what are uh, indicators of qualitative due diligence. Because I think we need to here move beyond kind of just describing the process and having requirements such as you need to have a policy, you need to have a, a conducted an audit. 
we need to be able to demonstrate indicators of what is actually qualitative due diligence. So how do we know that the actions that we are taking are having positive impacts for people on the ground? Uh, and here I would, uh, for, for those who are interested, I would really recommend a, a, a recent paper that was published by the organization SHIFT that is uh, called Signals of Seriousness that, that look at these kinds of indicators of what could be qualitative due diligence, which could also be a very important uh, input to the upcoming legislation, uh, where I think that this kind of perspective really needs to be implemented. Uh, so that the legislation doesn't become just an internal compliance issue for the company where we tick certain boxes and say now we're in compliance with the law. The, the outcome of the law needs to be better outcomes for people on the ground. That's what it's all about. We need to make sure that the actions that we are taking are having a positive impact on human rights. And in order to do so, I think we need to be able to adapt the due diligence requirements and what is reasonably expected of companies to certain realities that will be different depending on which industry we're talking about, the size of the company, where in the supply chain we are positioned. So again, that's why we need this, this full value chain approach. And I think that also to some extent addresses the question from an SME perspective. Uh, because, uh, I mean, if we apply the, 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 the uh, methodology and reasoning of the UN guiding principles is that the due diligence measures will, of course, be adapted to the size of the company, the severity of the risks and so on. So what is reasonably expected of a company like Ericsson with 20,000 suppliers will, of course, be something different if we're talking about a small company uh, with, with operations in just a few co countries. Uh, but I, I think we need to also approach this as uh, realizing that, I mean, without having the full value chain, including the SMEs, it will be much more difficult to, to address these issues. I mean, we're not discussing that SMEs should be exempted from trade compliance laws, from anti-bribery laws or from privacy laws. So why should they be exempted from respecting human rights? It's not about exempting companies, it's about enabling them and providing the right tools to, uh, to conduct due diligence in a way that is reasonable for the size and, 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 the, uh, and the sector of the specific company. So we're now trying to, 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 to do this in, in more kind of this going beyond the audit approach. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in this to getting the, the suppliers on board. Uh, to scaling this up beyond the pilot project in a single country. Uh, but hopefully the learnings from, from some of these exercises is something uh, that we can then use in, in, in other countries uh, and that we can also um, help uh, the, the suppliers to understand what are the, the, the questions that we are asking, why are we asking these questions, I think, as Nicole also said, it's not about policing, it's about building capacity and working together uh, to address some of those issues. Thank you. Thanks a lot. One question on my side again. Um, we said that raw materials is always a very crucial topic. Um, how do you ensure your human rights with raw materials suppliers in particular? Do you have a special process um, established? Uh, yes, so, so as part of the uh, responsible sourcing program, we also have a responsible minerals program specifically, uh, which is uh, based on the Responsible Business Alliance uh, on their Responsible Mineral Initiative, uh, where we work with our suppliers to get to, to map the full value chain and, 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 and gather information on, on the country of origin and, and uh, using the certified smelter uh, list uh, and also working accordingly to the OECD uh, guidelines on, on the sourcing of, of minerals from conflict affected and high risk areas. So that is a specific uh, part of the responsible sourcing program. But similarly, I mean, that is running uh, consistently, of course, but we are now also looking at because that's a very kind of top down approach. So how can, which reaches them to a smelter, but how can we then work from the other end as well, from the sourcing countries to, to uh, uh, then map the supply chain to the smelters to have a more full value chain approach and where we can work with organizations on the ground in 
countries where we know that we have uh, a, a probability of a, a lot of the minerals coming from and how, how we can build capacity together with uh, local uh, companies such as mining companies for example uh, but also of course civil society organizations so that's part of our uh, one of the salient human rights issues that we have identified is conflict affected or conflict related risks which of course includes sourcing of, of minerals from high risk areas yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think with regard to the time, I will hand over now again to Crispin and perhaps Dante, and as you have something to add, you have some contributions you would like to make to the business representatives. I think, Gus, you have a, a question already. Uh, th thank, uh, thank you, Sylvia. Perhaps to, uh, mostly I think to Nicole, and, uh, and if Theo would like to add, uh, uh, more than fine with that. Yeah. You know, with the, the OECD did a whole range of alignment assessment uh, mock audits. And what we saw reflected there, and what I also hear from some of the audits taking place is, uh, I don't think these are KPMG auditors, by the way, uh, they could be, could have been other auditors, uh, but uh, uh, they asked, uh, uh, especially upstream, uh, uh, suppliers, okay, have you identified any commercial risks without, as, as Theo referred to, pushing further to conflict related or to human or more specific human rights risks? Has, is there in your, in your experience already this change of mindset developing eh, eh, and that goes for both your own staff as to, as well as for the external auditors, that the risks are more are to be considered more widely. Let me try to answer your question. Um, although I, I think I need to uh, ask you specifically, um, since, for example, our suppliers would be temp agencies or they would be road transportation companies, sometimes small, sometimes medium size. Um, sometimes it's capacity brokers. Um, we definitely see a difference between Europe and the other continents, similar as Dante said at the beginning. Um, so the further away from Europe, um, the more conviction is required on our side also to make them understand that this is really a key topic. Um, besides the um, business results we are talking about, that this just belongs to the whole package in the future because the change of mindset is something that gradually happened already in Europe since decades and we just have to acknowledge that other continents or some specific countries are um, at a different stage in their own cultural evolution because I think it's mainly a question of also cultural understanding and what belongs to a business relationship and what should just be on the part of the supplier and the customer shouldn't really look too much into that. I think we need to have more of that dialogue in the future. Yeah, no, I can just uh, quickly uh, uh, maybe add that, um, uh, I mean, of course, I mean, we're having those conversations now about I mean, the, the commercial impacts of, of, uh, um, of, of complying with our requirements and, and, and um, why it is important for the suppliers. And I think one part of that, what we are looking at as well, is how we can better factor in um, their performance and their commitments, uh, for example, in establishing due diligence processes in uh, a earlier stage. So in kind of scoring the suppliers and, and engaging them so that they, they see, I think to, to what Dante mentioned, I mean, that they see that if they commit and if they improve, that actually has a positive commercial impact on the company as well. So it's not just a benefit for us, but it actually impacts how we kind of place orders, how we engage, and that they becoming a preferred supplier, for example. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Chris, when, um, something to add from your side, from the political perspective? No, look, thank you very much, Sylvia, and <clears throat> thanks for our business panelists. Just. Uh, to remind you, if you're if you are not already, and I know Theo, you're already involved in our uh, working group. I've had actually had a couple of um, 
messages in LinkedIn already to, to ask whether this could join. We'd certainly, um, my colleague Sierra Leda, who's also in on this call, would, would like to, to follow up with you and welcome you to our ICC Business Human Rights Working Group. Um, I was particularly interested in in um, your your experience, Janina, from the buyer perspective. I thought it was really uh, and fit a lot of the sorts of discussions that we've been having in our, our working group. Uh, so thank you. Um, Sylvia, I'll pass back to you, and I'm not sure if Oliver wants to say a, f a few more words, but from my perspective, this has been really interesting, uh, and I look forward to following up with many of you in, in future events. Yeah, thanks a lot, Oliver. Do you want something to add, or otherwise? Yes. <laughs> I yes. think we Very are briefly, over. first of all, thank you to the moderators, but also thank you to the panelists uh, from the political side and the business side. Uh, if there's one main takeaway that's by far from being comprehensive is in my view that companies are more and more living up to their responsibilities within their supply chains, uh, but they also need a stable legal environment, and interestingly enough, and not only for themselves, that's for sure, but also for their second, third and fourth tier suppliers who uh, sometimes live in uh, risky areas, risky countries, uh, and need more incentives, need more to, to be more active uh, with regard to uh, they are all because simply they don't know what to do uh, and I think this is a very strong and clear signal also back to uh, uh, to Raggi, uh, the late Raggi who, who exactly said that in his original report that the responsibility on both sides not only on the company sides but certainly also on the government and state side and I think if we all live up to that then I'm quite conscious and quite optimistic that the outcome will be uh, fine and good for everyone. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you very much for being with us and uh, stay tuned. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye.